from about the age of 15 to the age of 22, um, I didn't vary but maybe five to eight pounds of weight. I was six foot two when I was 14 years old. I played football in high school and I did everything I could to gain weight. I lifted weights, I ate all the food that I could get my hands on. I would take extra sandwiches to, to school and I would eat them before and after lunch. Uh, but I could, you know, maybe I'd gain three, four pounds. Then football season would start and I'd lose five pounds. I just, I couldn't gain weight. And some of you are like, oh, boo-hoo, I feel really sorry for you. <laughs> no, there is consequences what I'm about to tell you. When I was 22, a couple of things happened. One, I got married. My wife and I last week celebrated 30 years of what? <laughs> clap for her. That is a lot of patience, amen? Um, lots of patience there. Celebrated 30 years of marriage. When I was 22, I got married. I uh, quit playing a lot of sports that I'd been playing all those times, and uh, I got a job where I just stood. I wasn't quite as active as I had been. And in the first nine months that I was married, I gained 30 pounds. My wife is from East Texas, and she can cook. And I could eat. I remember we would, we would sleep in on Saturday mornings, and my wife would fry a pound of bacon. And I would eat it. I, would, I didn't want to disappoint my bride. I, would, I remember one night we, I came home, we were living in a one-room apartment, not a one-bedroom apartment, a one-room apartment. And I came home, and I mean, she had fried up a whole chicken. We had a bowl this big of mashed potatoes, gravy, biscuits. And I thought, who's coming for dinner? And she said, oh, no one, just us. And I was like, all right. Let me put on my sweatpants. I mean, you know. This morning, we're going to talk about transformation. That is not the transformation we are looking for. Right? Now, a couple more pounds and I'll be eligible for one of those shows where they transform and back to a skinny guy, you know? <laughs> Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 has been our theme verse throughout this study. Where, where the apostle writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And then verse 17 says, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And we have gone through 11 chapters of Romans where Paul lays out the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he approaches it from the point of view of the, the Jew, from the point of view of the Gentile, from the point of view of the individual, from the point of view of a group as a nation, how God is working, and all of these things that God is doing. And really, and we've emphasized this over and over again, but salvation is by grace through Jesus Christ alone. And we receive him by faith. And so this, that, that we receive Christ by faith and we walk by faith. We live by faith. And as we go from chapter 11 of Romans to chapter 12 of Romans, we're going to see a pretty big shift. Because as Paul has been giving us theology and doctrine and precepts that we could learn and understand about our relationship with God, he's now going to begin to put those into very practical terms. And I hesitated to talk about it last week, but I've been looking forward to this week ever since we started this series. Because Romans chapter 12 is my favorite chapter in all of Scripture. I love it. I, it, it. Because it's so practical. And it just, for me, spiritually, it's just kind of like, you know that boxer that um, kind of 
gets on the ropes and doesn't have the strength to throw a punch anymore and he's just getting pummeled. In some regards, that's how I feel when I read Romans 12. Like, you know, you ever seen when a boxer gets hit real hard and he goes off the rope and comes back just to get another one? You know? Because Romans chapter 12 just pounds us in a way of how we ought to live. The good news is we're not a boxer headed for a knockout. We're, we are people who are loved by God, saved through grace, uh, through the grace of Jesus Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit to live the way he has called us to live. And it begins with verses one and two. Where in Romans chapter 12 and verse number one, the Bible says this, be not conformed, or I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I was jumping the gun. I was ready to go to verse two. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I beg you, brothers, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, Paul's been talking to the Jews and to the Gentiles, and he's referenced the law in the Old Testament, and they understood sacrifice. It's kind of wild when you think about it. We, you know, we will use the word sacrifice in church, but, you know, uh, maybe around the offering, Amen? Some of you are like, yeah, we've heard it. But maybe we're going to talk about sacrifice today. But we don't have like actual sacrifices. Have you ever really thought about, and I don't want to be grotesque this morning, but what would happen? I mean, there were live animals. They would bring them down and ceremonially kill them, dress them, and burn them as part of their worship in the temple. The smells, the sounds, the sight that that was. A little bit different than our normal church service. Right? And yet Paul says here, present yourselves a living sacrifice. The first thing is, he's calling us to do that. And notice what he says, I beseech you, I beg you, I call you. I, I, it's, it's this word of extreme uh, passion. But he doesn't say, I command you or you have to do this. We should do this, absolutely. God calls us and commands us to obey him. But that's not the language that Paul uses here because what he is asking for is a willing sacrifice. He's asking for us to willingly submit ourselves to God. We've already learned in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14, sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under the law but under grace. Because the law was these sets of commandments that you had to fulfill. And if you fulfilled them, then you could feel good about what you were doing. The law was never intended for that. The law was intended to show us how we failed. But Paul says, listen, you're under grace and I want you to willingly sacrifice yourself. And then he says, it's a living sacrifice. John chapter 14 and verse six, Jesus famously said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The life. No man comes to the Father but by me, through me. It, everything about following Jesus and Christianity is life. Jesus died for us, but he rose back to life. In, in Christ, we are a new creation. He came to give us life abundant. We are promised eternal life, and we are to live for him. We are to be a living sacrifice. God desires for us to willingly give ourselves to him. And then he says this. He says, it's holy. 
Now, as I thought about this, I thought, that that's what the Jews would do, right? They would go and they would look for the sheep or the ox or the cow or whatever it was that they needed to sacrifice and they would, they would look for one that had no blemish. But none of us are holy. Romans chapter five, beginning of verse number eight says, but God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we, we should be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we should be saved by his life. Romans, we've already learned that the Bible says that God imputed or he put to our account his righteousness. In Romans chapter 12, as Paul turns and, and makes it practical. He says, I want you to present yourselves a sacrifice and I want that sacrifice to be willing, living, and holy. And willing and living might be fairly easy for us to do, but holy is a non-starter for all of us, amen? But God has imputed his righteousness to us. We are able to be a holy sacrifice before God even though we know we are unrighteousness because of the grace of God in our life. Not only that, but he says acceptable. Ephesians chapter one, verses six and seven says, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. See, when I think about my service to God and I think about that God desires for me to be a living sacrifice to him, I know, I understand theologically that God has imputed his righteousness to me, but still, it doesn't seem like anything that I could do would really be acceptable or pleasing to God. But Paul would write to the church at Ephesus that we are accepted in the beloved. We are an acceptable sacrifice to God. And then he says, which is your reasonable service. Now that Greek is interesting and it's translated a lot of ways, but that's not an inappropriate translation. But it does seem kind of like an absurd statement, doesn't it? I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That seems like a big deal, and then he says, it's your reasonable service. Really? Because that seems a little unreasonable until we think about what God has done for us. And then it seems pretty reasonable to live for one who has died for us. Amen? The New Living Translation does translate that phrase a different way, but I, liked, I like what it says as well. It says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind we find acceptable. And it translates that phrase this way. It says, this is truly the way to worship him. We come to church and our Sunday morning service at 10 o'clock is our worship service. For us, worship usually just means music. That's what we think. Oh, Jason's our worship pastor. We're gonna have a time of worship. And we know, okay, the band's gonna play and we're gonna sing. And, and we should worship when we sing. But we also worship when we serve and when we follow after God. And 
It is unreasonable to think that we would come together and engage in music of worship and lift our hands in praise and worship to God and then go from this place and not serve him and not be a sacrifice in our lives to him. It is reasonable for us to live for the one who has died for us. And so we are to present ourselves a living sacrifice. And then we get to verse number two. And he says, we see the result of the action. He says, present yourselves a sacrifice. This is the action that we take. And then really he's telling us the, what process this is gonna, gonna take. He says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Transformation comes when we sacrifice to God. When we sacrifice our will, our desire, our plans to what God would have for us, then he becomes free to work in our life and transform us and make us more into the image of his son. Don't be conformed to this world, he says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're to be transformed from the inside. Notice the words that are used. Don't be conformed to the world. These exterior forces that are seeking to mold you and bend you and make you into what the world thinks you need to be, pushing on you, pressing you, seeking to, to, to mold you in that way. Don't be conformed, but be transformed. That's something that takes place internally. And he says it starts in our head. It starts with our mind, the way that we think. And we are to be transformed. First Samuel chapter 16, you probably know the story. The prophet goes, Saul has been rejected as the king. And so he goes to the house, Samuel the prophet goes to the house of Jesse. He's to anoint a new king. And so he brings in the firstborn and the firstborn is good looking. The firstborn looks like the guy. But in verse seven, the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For, for the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord what? Looks on the heart. God looks, God's looking at us at, at our inside. And that's where he works. That's how he transforms us. Sometimes we get it backwards. We think, well, if you become a Christian, then you need to cut your hair a certain way and dress a certain way and act a certain way and wear certain clothes and do certain things. And, and, and it's all these outward things. Now, I'm not saying that, that having standards and doing certain things are not right. But what we need, what God does, is a heart and a mind change. God transforms us internally. Listen, I want Jesus to come out of me. I want people to see outwardly Christ, but first he has to do a work in me. He transforms us. That word is used four times in the New Testament, the Greek word there. Twice it's used in Matthew and Mark for the transformation that took place on the Mount of Transfiguration. You remember the story, right? Jesus went up, Peter, James, and John, they, they always had the, the, the front row seats to things. And Jesus was transformed from his earthly human form to this glorified heavenly form. They got a, 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 a picture, a vision. They saw Jesus in his, in, in, in his glory. Their first thought was to, to build a, something so that they could just sit there and worship. And so that word is used for the transformation of Jesus. It's used here in Romans chapter 12 and it's used 
in first Corinthians, or second Corinthians chapter three, in verse number 18, where it says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. I love that verse in 2 Corinthians. It says, we look at Jesus like a mirror. And as we do, we are transformed into his image. And so twice that word is used for the transformation of Christ into his glorified, his heavenly form. And twice it's used for transformation of us to be like Christ. That as we look at him, as we stare at him, his image, his glory is, is imprinted on us and we are transformed. But it comes, Romans 12 says, in the way that we think. And this is where I want to challenge you this morning. We're going to go a little bit out of order, Dale. I know I'm throwing you a curveball, but I want us to look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 13 where it says this, therefore gird up the loins of your mind. Now that's a weird phrase because girding up the loins was like, like tying your shoes tight and making sure your socks are pulled up and, and everything's fit and it says do that in your head. Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Peter says here, listen, you're to be holy as God is holy. That's a tall order. How do we do that? By girding up the loins of our mind, by focusing on our thoughts, by thinking about how we think. Now that's a lot of thinking. But Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, on the one hand, we recognize that this is a, this is, this can be a big event, a big thing, right? Like when we're saved, when we come to Christ and we ask him to forgive us of the wrong things that we've done, J Jesus said in John chapter three that we are born again. So we go from death to life. We go from destined to judgment in hell to destined to paradise and eternity in heaven. We go from, from enemy of God to child of God, lost to found. I was blind, but now I can see. All of these analogies, we are born again. And so this is a transformational experience. This is a, a, a new life in Christ. But it is not the only transformational experience because when we receive Christ as, as our Savior, we are not instantly made in the image of Christ. Amen? Some of you are like, well, I was. I mean, ever since I've received Christ, I've done nothing but act just like him. Perfect. You're who I want to talk to this morning. This is also an ongoing process, not our salvation, right? Because we are, when we, when, when we are born again, we are sealed unto the day of redemption. I'm not talking about we got to keep working to earn our salvation. We can't earn it. It's only by grace. We've seen that throughout the book of Romans. But our sanctification, the process in which we are changed into the image of Christ is a process and it is the transforming of how we think. So here's what I wanna challenge you with this morning. When was the last time you changed your mind? I'm not talking about, I thought I'd go with the chicken, but I think I'm gonna go with the hamburger. 
Not, I really thought this looks good on me, but on second thought, I'm not talking about that change. I'm talking about when was the last time you changed the way you think about something? Because for most of us, because of our upbringing, for good or bad, most of us either do things a lot like our parents or the complete opposite of our parents. And maybe both in different ways. But when was the last time you changed your mind? When was the last time your thinking was adjusted? And if that's been a while, then let's examine why that might be. The first possibility is that you already think exactly like Jesus. You are fully transformed and the, your mind is completely renewed and every thought you have is exactly what Jesus would think and exactly how Jesus would think. So that's not it. Maybe it's that God lacks the power to really change us. Maybe it's that the Holy Spirit really isn't strong enough to change the way that we think. And while the Bible speaks to the power and the transformational power of God, maybe it's just not really there. I don't believe that. So what's the problem? When was the last time that you read and studied scripture and it adjusted your thinking on a subject? Because the older we get, the more entrenched we get. We tend to drive the same brand of cars. We tend to buy the same types of clothes. We tend to do the same things over and over. We, we do the same things, we think the same things, and we don't change. Listen, every once in a while, it's not often, but every once in a while I help with the laundry in my house. And when I do, I am reminded of something. That my wife and my daughters particularly have a much broader color palette of clothes than I do. Now, I didn't specifically think of this illustration when I picked out this outfit this morning, but this is pretty representative of what I wear most of the time. Gray, blue, black. I can pretty much do all my laundry in two loads. You know, if a pastel gets in there, I know it's not mine. I'm set in my ways. My wife will tell you, as time has gone on, I've just gotten more and more monochromatic. <laughs> but isn't that the way we are mentally sometimes? That we think the same way, we do the same things. You might say, well, yeah, preacher, but I, I've got some things figured out. Well, maybe you do. The Bible tells us not to be tossed to and fro with every, every wind of doctrine. I'm not talking about that you walk in and go, well, you know, I tried Jesus for a while and now I'm gonna try something else. Listen, he's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through him. That was, that, I knew that as a little kid. That hasn't changed. I'm not talking about being tossed to and fro. What I am talking about is being transformed in our thinking by the renewing of our mind. And if you haven't read and studied God's word and that had an effect on the way you think about a subject, it's not because God, it's not because you're all exactly like Christ. It's not because God's word is not alive and the Holy Spirit lacks the power to change you. It's because you have resisted transformation in your heart and in your thinking. 
That's the only conclusion that's left. And I think that the older, I'll, I'll speak for me. The older I get, the harder it is to have an open mind about some things. Because I look at this world and I know the, the way I do certain things and I just, I'm entrenched. I was thinking about this this week. I have two brothers. Both of them, for whatever reason, rejected their upbringing and their, the, the way we were raised and they drive Fords. <laughs> I'm ashamed of it too, but <laughs> I lost half of you right there. Oh, Ford. <laughs> Listen, I'm just kidding. But they do. Two of my brothers drive Fords. And I drive a GMC, which is really just, you know, a Chevy with a little more chrome. But <laughs> I, I, th I thought about that before because when I was a kid growing up, my father had two pickup trucks. Both of them were Chevys. And those guys drive Fords. I'll stop. I'll stop with that part. But I was thinking about the way my, my father was. Like, my dad would tell me certain things. My dad would say, like, well, you need, like, a traditional. This was the time when, like, front-wheel cars were coming out. And he, he, he was kind of anti that a little bit. You know, he's like, you need a, you need a, a, a traditional drivetrain, like the engine in the front. And uh, although my first car was a Volkswagen, that's a whole nother story. But <laughs> he's like, the engine in the front and rear wheel drive. And my dad never had, he, he, didn't, he didn't have four wheel drives. Now, my thinking's a little different. I don't want to get stuck in the snow. Plus, you know, I want to be macho, so I have a four wheel drive. And <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> but we, we become entrenched in our thinking. And something new comes out. And for a lot of us, we're just like, well, I'm not burned. I'm not doing that. Now, it can be humorous, and that's fine if it's cars or trucks or whatever. But you know where it's not fine? The way we think about certain things related to scripture and to what related to how we ought to live. We don't have it all figured out. I know my thoughts are not exactly like Jesus. I mean, God has given us the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering. I just remember those first four and think I, I fall short in all four of those. I don't even get to the other ones yet. We're not all that we ought to be in Christ. And so we need to be changing and transforming in the way that we think. But for some of us, our minds are made up and we're not open to what God has to say for us, to us. First Corinthians chapter two and verse 13 says this, these things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? And then it says this, but we have the mind of Christ. We have access to the wisdom and the thinking of God. And yet for some of us, we're like, my mind's made up. And we live in a world where we, we set up filters for the news that we hear and the social media that we take in. And, but we have got to tear those things down when it comes to God's word. Because we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. He says that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Just a couple of things as we close here. First of all, 
Transforming our mind means faithfully trusting God's goodness. We've already seen in Romans chapter eight and verse 28 that he's working things out for our good. Genesis chapter 50 and verse 19, Joseph who was betrayed by his brothers, he was sold into slavery. He was unjustly accused and put into prison and yet God was always at work and he stands before his brothers having revealed himself as the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. Literally his life, their life is in his hands and Joseph says this, do not be afraid, for, I am, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Sometimes changing the way we think isn't natural, and we don't fully understand it. That's what it means. Re remember what it said, the just shall live by what? Faith. That means sometimes we don't see the outcome. God calls us to do things and think about things a certain way and we may not see how that comes out but we've got to follow him by faith and trust that he is good. Even when it seems like only evil, only bad will come from it. Not only that, but he says you may prove what is acceptable. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Listen, it's not easy being a Christian. It's not easy sacrificing ourselves and following after God. Those things can lead to difficulties, but it's a whole lot easier to go with God than against him. Listen, I know as a follower of Jesus Christ that my eternal destiny is, is heaven. I know that, that I'm going to end up in the image of Christ. Now you might look at me and say, you have a long way to go. And I could agree with you, but I know I'm going to get there, not because I'm going to accomplish that, but because of the work and the grace of God in my life. His his commandments are not burdensome. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? I just wanna leave you with two passages. From the Old Testament, Jeremiah 29 and verse 11 says this, for I know the thoughts that I think to, toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God has a plan and a future for each of us. He, he is working to transform us into the image of Christ. He has a plan. We don't always see it. We often don't understand it. But it doesn't mean he's not at work because the just live by faith. Ephesians chapter two and verse number 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I know it's football season and I know for some of you that don't enjoy sports, you may not appreciate the analogy and I apologize. But I used to coach. And this time of year is always interesting because it's that time of year where you get a football team together and you begin the process of coaching them and teaching them. And football, I found more. I also coached basketball. Basketball, you only got five guys. Everybody knows you're trying to put the ball in the bucket every time or keep the other team from putting the ball in the bucket. But football's got a lot more moving parts. You've got 11 guys on each team. You got offense and defense and special teams. And you start out the season and you're doing drills and you're putting guys through the paces. And oftentimes they don't understand what you're trying to do. 
A good coach will recognize that you've got so many weeks of practice and then you're going to have a scrimmage and then you're going to have a game and ultimately you're trying to prepare them for the game but they often will not understand it. And you may work a drill and, and you're asking them to move their feet a certain way and square their shoulders a certain way and hit a guy or, or be in a certain position and for the player it may not make sense. Especially when you've got a player who's just, you're doing drills that are one-on-one -on -one because that's not the way football is. But then a good coach will begin to put the pieces together. I'm not telling you how, I'm, how I coach. I'm telling you what a good coach would do. He puts the pieces together and in the end, the team works together to accomplish the goal. And I think about that oftentimes the way I think about God's work in my life. When God is laying on my heart about something or God is, is, is revealing shortcomings in my life or, or circumstances in my life are taking place and I don't understand how what I'm going through right now fits into God's plan for my life. But that's not really the point because my job is to walk by faith, to trust in him, that he is a good God and he is working to transform me to the image of God and that he has a plan, a work for me that he created before the foundations of the world. And I don't understand that, but that's why he's God and I'm not. But if we're not careful, as we get older and more mature and wiser, we become entrenched in our thinking. And we're no longer as pliable to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And if we're not careful, we can even become stubborn in our thoughts and our thinking. And when that happens, our growth to be like Christ is stalled. And I want to grow more like Christ. And so that means I've got to be open to the Holy Spirit. And I've got to be open to the scriptures. I don't have to be open to everything in this world, but I've got to be open to the Holy Spirit and, to, and, and God's word working in my life. And I want to challenge you. to examine your own life and to think about the way you think. When was the last time God changed your mind? When was the last time your thinking was adjusted because of God's word and the Holy Spirit at work? And if that was a long time ago, be open to the renewing of your mind, the transforming that God desires to do to make us into the image of Christ. Our gracious God in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. I thank you for Romans chapter 12, verses one and two. And God, I can think of years ago, decades ago, when you used that passage to have an influence on my heart. And God, even again this week, reminded me of, of my need to be open to your word. God, your word is, is alive and it's powerful. Your Holy Spirit indwells us and is working in us. And God, I pray that you would help us to be open to your transforming power. Renew our minds. Adjust our thoughts, God. Make us, transform us more into the image of Jesus Christ. It is in the name of our holy Savior we pray these things. Amen.